praise God. Well, let me invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me once again to the Gospel of John. We're right at the midsection of John, John chapter 9, and our focus for this Lord's Day will be in verses 13 to 23. You're going to notice Jesus says nothing in these verses, and he has very little actually to say in this chapter. However, anything Jesus does say, as, as minimal as the amount of words are, are exceedingly significant. And we will hear from our Lord at the end of this chapter. That can be found on page 1064 of the Pew Bible in front of you. And as you turn there, I want to, t- I want to say that I've titled this message, Blind Religiosity. As we look at the verses before us, we tend to title the chapter, Jesus heals the blind man. But there's something else going on here that is equally significant. Because Jesus is trying to show us that there are people who live and believe that they thrive in their blind religiosity. That is, in their blind acts of religion. Their acts of religion that keep them from seeing the true religion, which is the practice of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so if you have that out, let me invite you to rise as we prepare ourselves to read the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. Verse 13 begins with this. They, referring to the people who had witnessed this man's now, um, uh, this man's healing, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he, referring to Jesus, put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see now? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things. Because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, ask him. He is of age. Let us pray. Our holy Father and most glorious God, we are so thankful for your word. Father, all too often we would get to the healing and then jump to the words of Christ and miss all of the significance in between. But we don't want to do that this morning, oh God. We want to see what you are highlighting for us in these verses. We know that they speak to a specific people in a specific time, but Lord, they also speak to us. And so help us to see your word. Help us to apply it to our hearts, to our understandings, that we may glorify you with our lives. For we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Blind religiosity. You say, how did this guy get that from these verses, right? Well, I want to share with you this morning just a little bit of background information on sermon preparation. How do you basically go about prepping for a sermon? How do you determine these are the blocks of Scripture 
that I want to preach on. How do you not say, well, I'll just preach the entire chapter? I know many guys that preach the entire chapter. They'll read the whole chapter, and then they'll focus in on one specific area of Scripture. And no matter whether you're focusing on a big chunk of Scripture or, as I like, I prefer focusing in on a small part of Scripture, there's something that you need to do. As you read the text, you've got to zero in on the individual thoughts of the text. And as you zero in on those texts, you've got to kind of highlight what God is trying to tell us there. Because as I said before, the scriptures are not just informative, they're also prescriptive. They're informing us of something and they're prescribing for us an understanding. And we would do well to embrace what the scriptures are prescribing. Some pastors like to call what this is, you know, focusing on the big picture. What's the big picture? Whenever I talk with Pastor Jay and we talk about the sermons, he tells me, what's your big idea? What's your big idea? I said, Jay, I got no big ideas. I, don't, you know, I, I, got, I recycle stuff from dead guys, you know what I mean? I look to see what the smart guys said, and I, and I see if that's what's in line with Scripture, right? But, but that's, really, that's really true. You want to focus on what's the big idea? What's the main point that is trying to be communicated in the Scriptures? And as we look at the verses before us today, the main thing that I see in these verses is this, willful blindness. Willful blindness. This is something that was happening to the people. It was something that was happening to the Pharisees. And it is something that continues to happen today. You ever know anyone who lives in willful blindness? And I'm not, I'm not even speaking about spiritual blindness. Just willfully blind to everything that's going on around them. Well, why are we willfully blind at times? Sometimes it's because we don't want to face the truth. And sometimes in that, it's because we know that the truth will be painful to us. A lot of things that are said are not hard to understand. They're just hard to digest. It's like taking bad medicine, right? A, a, a horrible medicine. I remember when I was a kid, my mother would say, this is going to make you feel good. Really? Cod liver oil? And there, a spoon of that cod liver oil would go into my mouth, and I'd be like, I don't know how that's supposed to make me feel good. It tastes like I was, I was sucking on a trout, right? But yet, that was good for me. It's good for you. You can do it. I'm not going to do it anymore, but you can do it, right? But quite often, we don't like the truth, not only because it bothers us, right? but because it also destroys a view that we have always held to be true. Many people love to live in fantasy. They say, what's true to you may not be true to me, and what's true to me may not be true to you, and I'm all right with that. No, there's only one truth. And here's the interesting thing. Truth, <laughs> I love, I heard this and I just keep repeating. Truth doesn't care about your feelings. Truth does not care about your feelings. Truth is truth whether you like it or not. Truth is truth whether you receive it or not. Truth is truth whether you profess it or not. If you fail to tell the truth, the truth is going to get out there anyway. This is what we see in the verses before us today. We see willful blindness against the person and work of Jesus Christ. Many people still live that way. I was willfully blind at one point in my life. It was, it was too hard to look at Scripture because Scripture was telling me about my evil ways. So I was willfully blinded. I didn't want to see. I remember when my nephew was little. You know, we weren't saved and we were celebrating Halloween and I took him to the store, right? And I was going to buy a costume. You remember that, right? And he was so afraid of these costumes and I put a mask on and he go, no, Uncle Mike, no, 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 no. And he would just keep closing his eyes, right? He did not want to see what he knew what was in front of him. And just like that child, that's how we live. There's certain things we don't want to see because they're too painful. They're too hurtful. But you know, when we get ready to go like this, know this, God is trying to do this. He's trying to pull your hands down and say, no, no, you've got to see what I want you to see. The only way to grow is to see what I want you to see. Another term for willful blindness 
is bias. Bias. Yeah, we say, no, this is what I like, and so I refuse to accept anything else. This is the way I have grown up. This is what my family has taught me, and so I refuse to hear any other view. This is what I learned in my church. Let's bring it back to the church. This is what I learned in my church growing up, and so you know what? I'm not going to accept what you say, what you teach, because I have such great and fond memories of those days growing in Christ that you, what you're trying to teach me, is just going to destroy it. Let me tell you something, my friends. Having grown up as a Jehovah's Witness, predominantly a Jehovah's Witness, I was so glad the day that God crushed my bias. Because then I was able to see the beauty of His Word, the beauty of His person, the beauty of Jesus Christ and of His work and how He is seated on high. He is right now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and we are living in the kingdom age where He rules from on high. And therefore, we don't have to rely upon the government or anyone else to make us complete because we are already complete in Christ. But know this, if you stay stuck in your bias, you are blinded by your bias. There are things that you just will not see. You won't be able to take them in. Why? Because you'll be blinded by your bias. This happens in the world and it happens in the church. How does it happen in the world? Well, sometimes we, we look at our relationships with one another, and we, we, we are dying to have relationships with someone, and so we overlook all of the nonsense that they put up with, all of the nonsense that they are, just for the sake of being in a relationship. Quite often, this happens with a lot of young people, right? They're dying to finally meet their soulmate. No, gee, let me just tell you first of all, Jesus is your soulmate. Okay, you know, everyone else is just who we've been put together with, you know, based on our love and our adoration for an individual. But we look for our soulmate and we refuse to see that this person is no good for us. And later on, when the beauty and the love fades and we're just left with each other and we got to go through life, then we realize, wait a minute, this is no bueno. That's no good for you non ablas. <laughs> It's no good. And then we say to ourselves, wait a minute, what happened here? Well, we refused to see the signs because we were biased in favor of this person and we let everything else go aside. Or our families, right? Sometimes, you know, listen, sometimes our kids just act rotten. But we refuse to see. Why? Because it's my little angel. It's my little princess. We refuse to see some of the things that they're doing that they shouldn't be doing and therefore we don't correct them. Why? Because we love them, and our bias is toward our love for them, and so we don't correct them as they need to be corrected. And what ends up happening with those little bundles of joy? They turn out to be, you know, the people that we don't like when we get older, right? But then there's our political bias as well, and we will overlook everything that is, that is ungodly about our political parties, which let me tell you, both parties are, or all three, I should say, they're all ungodly, right? But, we'll, but we'll, we'll overlook certain things. Because why? Because I'm a true blue Republican. I'm a true blue Democrat, true red Republican, or I'm an independent, right? And so we refuse to see what we should see. Why? Because of a bias. But it doesn't end there, beloved. We then apply that to religion. We apply our biases to religion. Now, this doesn't matter if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, it doesn't matter if you're in a false religion, but it sure as heck matters when it comes to Christianity. Why doesn't it matter when it comes to other religions? Not to put the other religions down, but the reality is they're not in the truth anyway. So if you had a bias towards something else, it really doesn't matter because no matter which way you slice it, you're all wrong. And only Christianity is right. And it's right because it's been the promise of God since it was known under its other title, Judaism. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. And so we see that through that fulfillment, that everything that God has said has come to pass. We are saved the, 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 in the gospel. It tells us that, we're, that, that, that we are receive faith through faith. 
What? Faith from the faithfulness of God, that's how we get faith. And so therefore we're called to abandon all of our biases and to embrace whatever God says. This has been a problem all throughout history. This is why they had a development of the Pharisaical system, the Pharisees, right? And so when we look at the Pharisees, we realize that they were exceedingly biased. As we read about them throughout Scripture, we see that they were exceedingly biased toward holiness, but not necessarily the holiness of God. It was a holiness that they added to the holiness of God. And I think it's important that we understand the definition of the name Pharisee or the title Pharisee. And it's one who is separated. That's what Pharisee means, one who is separated or one who is holy. But in their, in their zeal to be separated from the world, they added additional burdens on to the word of God. And so in essence, what they ended up doing was not only separate, separating themselves from the world, but separating themselves from from God as well. You see, they became too holy for God. They became so holy that they couldn't see the Holy One in front of them. And that's a trap for each and every one of us. That's where we got to be careful, that we don't allow our holiness to separate us from God. What do I mean by that? Thinking we're better. You know what? The Bible says this, but I'm going to add something else to it, right? Because I see that people don't even listen to that. So God, I'm going to tighten it up for you a little bit. Yeah, you, you, you did a good job. You laid a nice foundation. But I'm going to enrich that foundation for you. The Pharisees, they added many burdens to the practice of the law that God did not require. Please keep that in mind. They're adding things to the law, to the practice of the law, that God did not require require. I want to share with you Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. Listen to this verse. Everything, this is what God says, everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. Let's break that down. Everything that I, God says, command you, you shall be careful. Careful. In other words, you shall hold my word before you like this and be careful not to drop it, not to distort it, not to, you know, hinder people because of it. You shall be careful to do. And then he adds to that, you shall not add to it or take from it. Now, there's a sin in there. There's a sin in violence, not just because you're violating what God says, but think about this. When you're adding to something that God commands, you're saying, God, you're not doing enough. You're a little too lax here, God, so I'm going to help you out. I'm going to make this more difficult. Or when you take away from it, what you're saying is, God, <laughs> slow down, big guy. You're being a little too rough. You're being a little too tough. We're just human. <laughs> we, you know, what do you expect from us? And so we've got to be very careful when we read the words of God, and we've got to be very careful to handle them with care and to never add to them or take away from them. Why? Because you know what the, re the, what the result is? Self-righteousness. You know, God said this, but look at me. I go an extra, a step further, you know? I have friends like that in, um, in business, right? And the time to start was 9 o'clock. They'd be there at 7. Yeah, I know. Everyone else, all the losers start at 9 but I get in there two hours earlier and I leave two hours later, right? So look at me. And then when those people didn't get the promotions, they were like, why not? Look at me. I've been the king of the office. I've gotten here earlier and stayed later than anyone else. But that wasn't required of you. You did that for yourself. What did you do for the company? And so in a lot of ways, as we read about the life of the Pharisees, again, I say, you know, we're, 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 it's so... So typical for us to just put the black hats on them, make them the villains. But the Pharisees is really an image of who we can be inside as well. We can be those people that live self-righteous lives and therefore live in a bias toward others. 
That's what we can be. And that's why we've got to be very careful. That's why when we look at verses like this, we've got to be very careful. We've got to slow down and say, wait a minute. How does this still exist around us today? I wanted to share with you what Jesus says about the Pharisees. Listen carefully to his words in Matthew 23, verses 13 and 15. He says, woe to you. Now, right there, if Jesus is telling you, woe to you, that should stop you dead in your tracks. There should be a chill that goes up your spine that says, what is he going to say to me? And notice the words he uses, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Why does he throw the scribes in there? Well, they felt that because they had, they had a, a, a command over the language, that they were the ones that were constantly writing the word. And we know that as you write, as you physically write, you absorb more of the word. So they felt because they understood the word of God and perhaps they could rescribe the scriptures with their eyes closed, they felt that they had a greater sense of holiness. But he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. That is, you who have set yourself apart. And then he calls them hypocrites. Now, that's interesting. Why does he call them hypocrites? Well, his point is this. You are trying to be so holy, so much holier than everyone else, that what you're telling God is, I'm even holier than you. I'm even holier than you. And the very sins that you're condemning other people for, you yourself are guilty of. Because when we think that we are holier than anyone else, believe me, we will ascribe that to God. And we see that that's what they're doing here with Jesus. And that, my friends, is idolatry. So Jesus calls them hypocrites. And listen to what he says. These are the actions of the hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of, of heaven in people's faces. In other words, you tell them, you're not good enough to come in here. Stay outside, spiritual loser. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Now, if it just ended there, that'd be like, wow, that's really, that's going to shake you at the core. But no, Jesus goes on. And he says again, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Notice he's using the same terms. And he's doing this very harshly. And he's insulting them. But the hope is that as they are insulted, they're insulted onto salvation. Sometimes that's the way you got to deal with the hypocrites. He says, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, that is to convert a single person to your way. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. How is that possible? Well, you know, we look at the Pharisees and say, they live like this, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to live harder than them. I'm going to be more hardcore in my religiosity. I'm going to be more hardcore in my separation from worldly things than even they are. Remember the monks, right? 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century monks. They would go out and they would say, I'm going to live in the desert by myself. This way I don't interact with this disgusting world. And I'm going to spend my days praying and fasting. What God is saying is, you're doing that for your own glory. You're not doing it for mine. But the worst part of that is then they judge everyone else based on their asceticism. And Jesus is saying, I want nothing to do with that. Which brings us to the gospel of John and the verses before us this morning. And here in verses 13 to 15, we see that religious bias hinders those who are seeking the will of God. And those who profess to know God or to know the will of God. So you see, it hinders everyone. Religious bias hinders everyone. Those who are seeking God through you because they think that you know him because you're so religious, you're so holy, you're so, you're so set apart, you have such high standards, even higher standards than God himself. It not only hinders them because they say, well, I can never live up to it. You ever been there? You ever been there? You, you, you have a good buddy that, that can play, you know, a great game of baseball or he's he's a strong weightlifter and you say so why i'd like to do those things but i can never be as good as them so you know why even try and that's kind of what happens here with this religious bias this blind this blind religiosity so not only do they hinder other people but they hinder themselves as well and here's just a few verses to sit in your mind as we go through these 
Paul writes this in, in first, I should say in Romans 1, verse 22 to 23. He says, claiming to be wise, they, referring to, referring to the unbelievers, right? Because you could be as holy as you want, but if you think you're holier than God, then you're an unbeliever. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God, the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now, this is speaking to a specific type of idolatry, but isn't all idolatry the same? Whether you're worshiping something else or you're worshiping yourself, it's still idolatry. So it says here in verse 13, they, referring to the people who had witnessed this man's um, conversion or, or, or the receiving of his sight, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it's important for us to say, why did they bring him to the man? Well, we know in the previous verses, some were saying, this is the man. And others were saying, no, it isn't him. It just looks like him. So they're going through a dispute here. They're saying, so wait a minute. And you got to remember, this is not a big metropolis city like we have today. It's a type of city where everyone knows everyone, right? Remember the small, the small town mentality where everyone knew everyone around you, right? So they knew what this man looked like. Chances are he wasn't changing his clothes that often. He had the same cloak week in, week out. He was the same guy that they were giving money or food to week in and week out. He was an older man, so they knew him as a child. They knew him as he grew up. So they were disputing over whether this guy was the guy. And why were they disputing? Because they couldn't believe that this man had received his sight who has been blind since birth. So now they're doing the right thing by bringing him to the Pharisees. Why? Because they're going to the Pharisees to get biblical guidance on this miraculous event. Right? They're saying, this is the way we understand it, but could we, we be wrong? Let's go to the people who know the word of God. They're putting their trust and their faith in the work of the Pharisees. Well, let's see how the Pharisees handle this. But know this, as we look at these verses, religious bias prevented them from receiving what they needed. These, here's something else to keep in mind. You're going to see in these verses that people are willing to believe anything but God. They're willing to believe in their religion. They're willing to believe in their traditions. They're willing to believe in themselves over and above the work of God. And so John gives us kind of this parenthetical statement. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So we say, whoops, Houston, we might have a problem here because Jesus did this on the Sabbath day. And what we're going to see in the verse as we continue through this is the miracle of healing, the miraculous healing that Jesus did doesn't seem to be so as, as important as the issue of violating the Sabbath. So you see where the bias is now? Wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got the Sabbath. Don't mess with that. Anyone messes with that goes to hell. They're not a believer. They're not a person of God. And so it says here, so the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. Please note that the Pharisees are not questioning this man because they want to know or they want to be sure that Jesus is the Messiah. They know that when the man's brought to him, they're, telling, they're saying, hey, this guy Jesus, he healed him. What say you? So they're bringing him before him, and they're going to question this guy. And notice the line of questioning. It's not so that they can praise Jesus. Because think about it. If this man is truly healed by the hand of God, then they should be singing a hallelujah choir, right? Praise be to God Almighty. Glory in his name, glory in his name. This is why we picked the hymns that we did this morning, because that's what people should be saying as they reflect upon the word of God, upon the work of Jesus Christ. But this is not what's going to happen. So he tells them plainly. He says, he, referring to Jesus, put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. So one of the things we can extrapolate from this as well is not only is Jesus in trouble, but so is this dude, because he took part in this guy's work on the Sabbath. He should have told him, whoa, buddy, whoa, back up. Don't put anything on my eyes. I hear you spitting. Sounds like you're going to do something here. No, 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 no. Back up. Let's wait till Monday. Let's wait till Sunday or Monday, but hold off, buddy. So he's culpable with Jesus. And really, as he says that, he put mud 
on my eyes. I washed and I was healed. It's almost like you could hear the Pharisees saying, got him, got him, that's it. Busted, right? Because you violated the Sabbath. You committed a crime. You worked on the Sabbath. And it's not just working on the Sabbath, but there's two crimes that you committed. The other one being you, create, you, you, you performed a non-emergency healing on the Sabbath. Yeah, that was the belief. The belief that you could only save someone's life on the Sabbath. That was the only thing that you could do. It was the only healing that you could perform. You could only call a doctor on the Sabbath if someone's life was in jeopardy. Now, this man had been born blind. He wasn't at risk of losing his life. He could have waited till Sunday, could have waited till Monday, any other day of the week, but you did it on the Sabbath. And so, what's the reaction to this? Well, listen, what they're saying is, you know, Jesus does not Jesus is violating their rules. But know this, Jesus has no regard for man's blind and biased religiosity. That's why he did it on the Sabbath. We can clearly see that. Jesus knows what the law is. He knows that this would be the part that would break, kind of that straw that breaks the camel's back, right? It's something so light, something so innocent, right? He is the Lord of the Sabbath that he performed this. And it's this little thing that will break the camel's back. I quoted Romans 1. Listen to verses 24, 25. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity. Now this lust often refers, Paul is speaking about um, uh, sexual immorality. But you know what? There's also a lust after power. A lust after religiosity. A lust to be the only one with the real goods to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And this is what they're going to do. They're going to dishonor themselves because they exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. So we're going to see how they react to this now blasphemous act, this act of insurrection against the will of God. We look to verses 16 to 17. And in these verses, we see that religious blindness causes division among the people of God. It's not just going to cause division with the, 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 the people who live around this man, but it's also going to cause division among the Pharisees. So some of the Pharisees says, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. That's their judgment. He must not be of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Could have done it any other day, but he chose to do it on this day. Some of them could not see past their religious bias. But listen to the contrast. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And they're, they're thinking logically now, right? And in their logical thinking, they're calling the other guys to think with them. Wait, wait, wait slow down. Before you commit, condemn him, think about it. How can a man, this is sort of a rhetorical question, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs. So it's, and there was a division among them, right? So we see here that Jesus is working in many different ways, right? We see that his work is working in many different ways to highlight some, someone's uh, uh, religious bias and to highlight others who are being led to faith. But know this, this rhetorical question is inviting the unbelievers to abandon their religious bias. In other words, God's speaking through those who are saying, but how can he be a sinner? How can he be a violator of the word of God? And listen, beloved, many times people will look at you in your life and because you don't embrace a worldly view of living, they'll say, how could you be a real Christian? The other day I was out, a little gathering, Right? And I, there was a person that was there that I felt was trying to draw me into a political conversation. So I entered the conversation with them, reluctantly, but I entered anyway, and I kept my comments very slim. But this person got exceedingly agitated, to which I really didn't get agitated at all. And then this person said something else to me was kind of nasty. And I said, you know why you're so bent out of shape? Because you have no hope. Your hope is rooted and grounded in this world. 
But I have a hope, and it's in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And this man immediately jumped up and said, you and the church and this and that. Ah. And I said, I said, I know why you're saying that, because you want to attack me. Because I don't share in your bias against the church. Right? And that's what's going to happen in, the, in, in life today, beloved. As you try to live out your life in Christ, people are going to say, you can't be a, a church lover because you don't love all people. Because you don't allow people to marry who love each other regardless of of their sexual orientation, right? Because you don't agree with the person who says, I'm nine binary, right? It, because we don't ascribe to everything in the world glory and praise, because we ascribe our glory and praise to God alone. They're gonna say, there must be something wrong with you. But listen to the words of the Pharisee. Based on how we live, if we're living according to the word of God, there's no way that we can be what they say about us. And so these Pharisees are trying to lead the others to a knowledge of the truth. But bias still gets in the way. So now they're not winning with each other. What do they do? They turn back to the blind man. It says here in verse 17, So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? Since he opened your eyes. You're the, in other words, the way they're addressing it is like, You're the victim here. What do you have to say about him? And what they're hoping for is that he'll say, you know what? If this guy was really a prophet, I know I said before he's a prophet, but if he really was, he wouldn't have done it on the Sabbath. I agree with you guys. You know, I renounce this dude. You know, you want me to stand, you want me to stand and be a witness against him? No problem. I'm your guy. They're seeking to file charges against Jesus. It's plain and simple. Right? And so how does he answer them? He said, he's a prophet. <laughs> Simple as that. He's a prophet. There's no other way that he could do it. Satan is not healing anyone. There's no demons running around and possessing people onto salvation. No, we know that throughout the life of Jesus, we see people being um, oppressed by demons, possessed by demons, and they're living horrible lives. So he said to himself, no, no, this guy has got to be a prophet. And that's how we've got to look at Jesus. That he is the prophetic fulfillment of all that God promised. And we're seeing this unfold in real time. He is a prophet. Now you would think that this man's witness of Jesus would change hearts. You would think, and really this is what should happen. The Pharisees should say, okay, you know what? Step aside. Guys, we got to talk. You know, some of us don't believe. Some of us do believe. But we got a real problem here because we need to have an answer for these people. But our answer must glorify God. We need to get together. This guy believes he's a prophet. No doubt other people believe he's a prophet. We have got to call this man over and speak with him and help us understand why, if he's a prophet of God, did he do this on the Sabbath? Because are we not supposed to um, uh, restrain ourselves from violating the Sabbath? Gentlemen, let us convene with this man, Jesus. Can somebody please go and get him that we may have a civil conversation and get down to the bottom of what God may or may not be doing here? You would hope that that's what would happen. I mean, logical people, right? People who claim to be believers in God would want to have a serious discussion about what just happened. Sadly, however, that's not what we're going to get. The bias will deepen. And so we see here in verses 18 to 23 that religious blindness will never be satisfied with truth. You can share truth all you want, beloved. You can share it till you're blue in the face. You can even believe that you're gaining ground with this person. But I love what R.C. Sproul always said. He said, a person convinced beyond their will holds to their original opinion still. In other words, you can win the battle with them, but if they are set in their hearts with a bias against God, then you will never convert them over. Only the Spirit of God will do that. Which reminds me of Proverbs 29, 11. A fool gives full vent. In other words, a full open-throated vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And we're going to see the full vent of these Pharisees. It says here, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see, does he now see? 
So they're not satisfied with the testimony of the people. They're not satisfied with the testimony of the man because the people brought the man to, to the Pharisees and then they questioned the man. They're still not satisfied, especially since he said, this man is a prophet who healed me. So what they do, they said, let's get the parents in here. There's got to be some trick that we can uncover. And so what they do, they drag the parents in. And they're the parents. And this is sad for me because these parents are being strong-armed into saying something they do not believe to be true. And that's what John is breaking out for us in these verses. But they're afraid. Imagine being brought before not just the religious authorities, but these religious authorities had the authority to throw you in jail. Imagine, if, imagine that. I know you look at me, you say, bald guy, looks a little angry sometimes. I know when I talk sometimes, I'm being serious. I look like I'm angry. One of my secretaries years ago said, Mr. Ross, why are you always so angry? I said, I'm not angry. I'm just thinking, you know? But, you know, you knew if you didn't believe something, you're not coming before my tribunal, right? But in those days, you were. If you failed to believe something, you were going before that tribunal, and that tribunal could land you in jail, could cost you your life. So here are these poor parents. They've been struggling all their life. And listen, at this point, it's the, it's the son who should be taking care of the parents. But the parents are continually taking care of the son. And now their feet are being put to the fire. The fear of religious retribution brought on by blind religiosity, the parents will falter. This is what's going to happen. The parents are going to be pressured, and sadly, they will falter. It says here, his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. And this is sad because as we know, as John will continue, they do know, but they're so afraid of the bias around them that they won't say what they know to be true. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever been in an environment where one Christian speaks up and everybody jumps on them and you say to yourself, I was going to say that, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut now. And God is saying, don't, don't keep your mouth shut. Stand and open your mouth. Stand with my son. Look at these poor people. And listen, and to some degree, you can't blame them, right? Because of the threat that they faced. And we'll go over what that threat was. But how scary is it to be the one that's against the world? But remember this. Jesus says, if they hate you, remember, they hated me first. And so if the world hates you, you're in great company. Because you're standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then they say the only thing they could say to try to get out of it. They say, ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Which hearkens us back to the words of Jesus in John chapter 5. He says here in verses 43 to 44, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. They're not receiving Christ again. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. And we could also say, you would gladly receive him. He says in verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And so the Pharisees there were seeking glory from one another. And sadly, however, these parents, perhaps they weren't really seeking glory, but they were so afraid that they couldn't answer as they believed. The religious blindness of the Pharisees is causing the parents to rob Jesus of his glory. And here's the reason, verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. They knew what the right thing was to say. They knew the testimony, but they feared the Jews. Why? For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, ask him, he is of age. Think of that. Put out of the synagogue. Now you say to yourself, big deal. I'll go to another synagogue. Christ Community Church, you tell me I can't come no more? Big deal. Highlands Bible Church is right down the road. They tell me I can't come anymore? I go to the Methodist Church. They tell me I can't go anymore? I'll go to the Catholics for a little bit until I find another place. But it wasn't like that in the first century. 
And this, this term that's here that, 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 is, that is referenced, put out of the synagogue, refers to a word. It's one word that has to be translated into five words, right? And it's this word um, in the Greek, and it refers to the synagogue or to be desynagogued, right? Apostosunogogos, right? And this word really means to be desynagogued, right? You will be stripped. You will be removed from any and all synagogues. Synagogue life, synagogue practice, synagogue benefits. What does that mean? Well, it means this. It means you have got to choose between the synagogue and Jesus. Which do you want? Do you want this guy who claims to be the Christ? Or do you want the synagogue? Because with the synagogue comes all the privileges of the synagogue. It means that you will be able to have commerce if you're part of the synagogue. You will have friendships if you're in the synagogue. You will be able to worship God if you're in the synagogue. But if we desynagogue you, so to speak, then you won't have any of that. Then you're left to good luck trying to buy anything, trying to have friends, trying to make a living, good luck. So that's why these parents were afraid. They are afraid that all of their friends, they would lose all their friends. They would be outcasts. And where are you going to go? You're not going to go anywhere. You're going to live in shame all your life. And so they were afraid of being desynagogued, so to speak. Aposunogogos. And these were frightening words. It was being like defellowshipped around the world. These are frightening things for them. This is what they were doing to the people of God. They were holding them hostage throughout their life. And sometimes that's the way it feels as a confessing believer. Sometimes you say to yourself, you know what? There's things I just can't do. But then you have well-meaning friends who come on you and say, if you're a real Christian, guess what? You don't dance at parties. If you're a real Christian, then you don't have a drink. Right? No, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. What did David do? David danced. Right? What did, what, what did Jesus do? He drank wine. He didn't drink watered-down wine. He drank wine. Why? Because it was fermented, and it was good for the belly. In fact, Paul tells Timothy, drink some wine for your stomach. It'll make you feel better. Right? And so we see that these things, these are added pressures that people put on the people of God that don't lead them into a closer relationship with God, but lead them away from God. Now, these parents have to make a decision. Do I get desynagogized, so to speak, in order to embrace Jesus? Or do I stay in the synagogue and then I still have commerce and friends and so on and so forth? Sadly, however, many people will choose their bias over Jesus. So I say to you today, you've got a choice. We've always got a choice. And if you're a confessing believer in Christ and you've already made that choice, to walk with Christ, but yet we still have choices. If you want to be sanctified in Christ, you've got to let go of your bias. If you want the church that you, that you worship in to grow, you've got to let go of your bias. If you want your relationships with one another to flourish, you've got to let go of whatever, whatever is holding you back from growing in Christ. I want to tell you the final outcome of religious bias, and it's this. It led Jesus all the way to the cross. They levied charges of him of blasphemy. Why? Because of their religious bias. They're saying this man cannot be a man of God. He must be a sinner because he violated God's law. And Deuteronomy um, chapter 13 actually begins, and verses 1 through 5 begins with this notion that if anyone leads people away from God, you are to stone them to death. Why? To purge this evil from your midst. This is how they're going to treat Jesus. This is how people continue today to treat Jesus. This is how they're going to treat you, my friends. This is how they're going to treat me when we stand firm in the Word of God. We've got to ask ourselves, am I willing to take the heat I feel bad for those parents and all they endured. I pray that, I hope that they came to a saving knowledge of Christ at a later point, right? But how many people were beat down and continue to be beat down by religious bias each and every day? How many people are hindered in their walk with Christ because of 
religious bias. But know this, Christ rose from the grave. He is seated on high. He is interceding for you at this very moment at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He is Lord. He is King. Why? Because we live in the kingdom age. We live in the age that Christ rules on high. And your faith is going to be challenged. It's going to be challenged by people who have a bias against it. But we, beloved, are called to stand firm in the person and work of Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with these last words from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 16. And if you've been studying with us on the book of Ecclesiastes, you realize that God is always making a distinction between the person who believes to be wise and isn't. They're wise in and of themselves. And God equates them with the fool. Pastor Solomon writes these words. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. In other words, here today, gone tomorrow, nobody remembers them. Seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. Right? Saying, one day, then I, rem- I don't remember any of these Pharisees' names. We remember them. But we don't remember their names. Why? Because they're not important. And then he reflects on this. How the wise dies, just like the fool. How the person who is wise in and of themselves dies just like the fool who never believed. That's the concept here, right? And so when we encounter people who have a strong bias that is hindering people in their walk with Christ, our job is not to attack them, but to pray for them. And to know that, you know what? In a very real way, we could be like that as well, right? And yet Jesus prays for us. And so let's look at the three takeaways that I have here for us this morning. And the first is this, religious bias was the driving force of Jesus' arrest and conviction. Yeah, they're going to levy further charges against him, right? And it's going to happen to you too. It's, it's already, it, it's happens, it happens to me, and I'm pretty sure it's already happened to you in many ways, right? That's fine. That's fine. Call me whatever you want to call me. Just make sure that when you call me that, make sure you throw Christian in there. You want to call me bad Christian, this Christian, that? I don't care. Just throw Christian there because that's my title, Christian. The second takeaway, religious bias is an enemy of Christianity because it separates man from God. It says, we're too good for you. You're not good enough. Religious bias is an enemy of Christianity because it puts the focus on man and not on God, thereby separating us from God. And finally, only by the Spirit of God working through the Word of God will we escape our biases. Yeah, you want to live an unbiased life? Great, I want that for you as well. Read more of the Word of God. Let that Word convict you. Let it transform your life. Let it hit you in the face like a slap. And sometimes that's what we need, right? Sometimes we need a little bit of a scriptural slap to straighten us out, to realign us with the Word of God. Let that happen, beloved, because that is what will change your life, and God will use that to bring honor and glory to His one and only Son who loved you and gave Himself for you. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our Holy Father and most gracious God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank you for this account, O God, and Father, it's so easy to just look at the Pharisees as the bad guys, Lord, but we know that there's a little of that in each and every one of us. Father, help us to shed our Pharisaical views of religion, of practice, O God, and help us align ourselves with your word that we would not hinder anyone in their walk with Christ, but that all would know him as he has portrayed himself, and as he has depicted in your word. Father, help us to be fully transformed into the image of your Son, that we may glorify you throughout our lives, not worrying about what other people think, but being concerned with what you say. Apply this to our hearts, O God, for we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.